Now for an incredible change of pace from the previous talk. <laughs> so, all right, yeah, you've already introduced me. And so the topic today, I'm going to start out by mentioning uh, the recent Nobel Prize in Chemistry for 2017. So what you see here is an improvement in the ability to image biomolecules with a transmission electron microscope. And so this kind of technology is so hard, so hard to come up with and so important that Dobuchet, Frank, and Henderson won the Nobel Prize. And that image in this press release you can find on the Nobel Prize website. And this cryo electron microscopy improves the imaging of biomolecules. And you'll see why I mention that as we go through to the end of the talk. All right. So what do you need to understand when you're making <coughs> electronics, uh, especially the kind, the silicon kind that you have in your cell phone and your computer? And uh, we're used to, or at least those that work on it are used to thinking about. You need to understand something about the local atomic arrangement of atoms. And so the way that that's been done is with X-ray diffraction. So we'll talk about that in a second. But why do you care about the atomic arrangement of atoms? Well, it impacts things that you use every day, and it changes the properties. Let's just look at carbon, one element from the periodic table, and you arrange it in a special crystal structure called the, literally called the diamond crystal structure, and you get, if you get a, enough diamond, la, you know, together, you have a nice diamond, you wear it on your engagement ring or whatever. You put it in a totally different atomic arrangement, and you get graphite, and you use graphite and lead pencil, or what we used to call lead pencils, or you can have it in the form of soot. All of those have totally different functions. So the our atomic arrangement changes the material's properties. So it's really important to know what that atomic arrangement is. And so the way that people understood atomic arrangements, in fact, the way that it was used to understand how DNA, what the DNA structure was, was uh, X-ray diffraction. So what's X-ray diffraction? Well, X-rays are light, very high energy. You put them through a crystal, and the, the crystal structure, the atomic arrangement, diffracts that, those X-rays, and you get, a, you get an, a, a structure here, and that's this periodic array of diffraction peaks changes with the periodic array of the crystal that you're trying to understand. So that's how you can tell the difference between those different carbon structures that I just mentioned. So let's look at something that's been locally here in Albany area. My grad student Avery Green did this high resolution uh, transmission electron image of the crystal structure of this bismuth selenide uh, crystal here, so with this kind of an interesting crystal. So let's talk about that for a second. So you have these arrays of this uh, plane of s selenium, and in purple, as everyone knows, bismuth is purple. It's a joke. <laughs> selenium, bismuth, selenium, bismuth, selenium. That's called a quintuple layer. There's five layers of atoms, and they bond to each other very weakly. It's called Van der Waals bond. Well, you can see that. Amazingly, you can see these kinds of atomic arrangements in a transmission electron microscope when it's a very special one that has aberration correction. So you can see this dark line here. That's what you would find between these quintuple layers. You can see the, the selenium, bismuth, selenium, bismuth, selenium, the bismuth being the lighter uh, the lighter atoms, if you will, in this image. And if you look top down, so that's sort of a, a if you're looking at this crystal structure, or look at the side, if you look at top down, you can see a hexagonal pattern. So you can see the local atomic arrangement, and if you know enough about bismuth selenide, it tells you something about the functionality of bismuth selenide. So how does this impact what we're doing in electronics? Well. The transistors in your cell phone or your computer, the heart of those electronic chips, the transistors are getting smaller and smaller, and you probably have heard that. And so this is taken from Dick James' Siliconica uh, column in Solid State Technology. You can see the constant shrinking from 22 nanometers, 14, and 10 nanometers. So 10 nanometers is 100 angstroms. 
And if you look at the distance between those two fins, and we're gonna, I'm gonna tell you why that's important in a second, it's 340 angstroms. So it's incredibly small how small the transistors are. And one of the things you gain with making these transistors smaller is you can pack more transistors into a smaller area and that, trans, uh, that uh, microprocessor can do more computing for you. And sometimes when you make them smaller, in fact, most of the time, they can get faster. So why do they call them fins? So instead of looking straight on at them, you look at them in this perspective, you can see that they look like a, a long shark fin-like structure. And you can see that often they're patterned in an array. And that's a, a PowerPoint drawing, if you will, of what you're seeing right here. And you're seeing that there's two together in that particular structure. So people were imagining something beyond just these fin transistors, that's the thing in the microprocessors in your cell phone and so forth. They were thinking they could make nanowires. And so uh, someone I know well, Brian Corgal at the University of Texas, was making these nanowires of germanium. And they have a certain crystal structure here. He made them with these little balls, tiny little particles of gold put them into a, his reactor, and he can grow these germanium wires on them. And another person, Charles Lever at Harvard, making his own uh, semiconductor nanowires, made a transistor out of them. So people thought that this would be a great thing to do 15, 20 years ago. And the reason was is because, well, it's hard to explain without going into a lot of electronics, but because this part of the transistor was all the way around this wire, you should get a better performing transistor. All right, go forward to today. Well, what do we have? So people imagined that a nanowire might be a great way to make a transistor in the future. And so today, using that same fin structure that you saw in a few overheads ago, people have used that in a lot of very difficult processing to make transistor nanowires. And so they're highly ordered here. You can see the order in that structure here. And one version has these 80 angstrom diameter nanowires in it. And that was done at IMIC in Belgium. And locally here at IBM, they had a nanowire that has a more oval shape like that, they called them nano sheets. So people have taken that idea, the idea that the, the the transistor gate should wrap all around the, transist the uh, channel or where the, the electrons flow through to make the transistor work better. Now people are making it, and maybe after these research articles are, 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 uh, that you see here, 2016, 2017, very recent, maybe that'll be the transistor of the future. It's certainly under some strong consideration. Right, so that gives you a, another piece of information. It takes a long time to incubate ideas from a research lab that's not really working in, in nanoelectronics and their thoughts of well, maybe we can use that in nanoelectronics to something that could actually be used in real life. Ah, another idea people had was using graphene. Remember you saw earlier in the talk that uh, the pencil the graphite in a pencil, you move it across the paper and you leave behind the, the lines that you see. Those are little sheets of graphene or single layers of carbon atoms. So here we have an image of the hexagonal structure of graphene that's been quite famous recently. It's a graduate student, Florence Nelson, who was a member of my group. She's now uh, off quite gainfully employed mm -hmm. and wanted robo. Uh, at Oak Ridge National Lab who took this image on a very special transmission electron microscope. So that, that you know, you can see where the atoms are located in that. That's, a, that's an amazing achievement if you ask me. All right. When you start to put together structures that might be used in some sort of wild future nanoelectronics, you see this putting the graphene between pieces of boron nitride and you look at a cross section of that and you see that's where the graphene is you start to lose your ability to see the individual structure. So even doing some amazing electron microscopy and putting together a difficult structure, and this was done at you know, Jim Hone's group at 
at Columbia and is part of a, a, a center called Index, which uh, I happen to be the director of. Um, he, he was working on this interesting material set for possible future nanoelectronics made with graphene. So that, that's in the, you know, in the mix. It's a long way from being realized, and it's very, uh, if you will, very speculative. All right. So people are thinking about how to make electronics and different kinds of electronics. The graphene idea was a very different kind of switch, if you consider a transistor to be a switch. So what happens if you take the electronics that we have today and you think about the fact that the way it uses data, its memory, the memory of these, these uh, uh, computers and how it moves the data around is very inefficient. What happens if you made it think like a, a human does, like your brain does? So Professor Nate Cady, who's a professor at SUNY Polytechnic Institute, has been working on this and, and what he's done is try to make some sort of electronic structure from traditional electronic pro you know, processing that you'd use in a, in a factory that makes silicon integrated circuits and make that circuitry work like the neuron in your brain. And the reason the neurons, even though it works kind of slowly compared to a transistor, because it has many interconnections, it's very effective at what it does and it uses very low power. So they're making electronics that does this so-called cognitive comp computing or neuromorphic computing. That is an interesting idea and it's very feasible because you can use the manufacturing capability you already have. And so maybe in a few years you'll see this. And in fact, if you go on the websites of IBM or Intel and you ask for uh, search for neuromorphic computing or cognitive computing, you'll probably can find some interesting information there. That's kind of cool. All right, but what happens if silicon nanoelectronics is replaced by some sort of biologically based nanoelectronics? And why would you even think about that? And so I recall the time that, that uh, Jack Kelby, one of the two people that invented the integrated circuit, came to visit where I used to work and he said, you know, back when I invented that, there were, you know, old-fashioned large power transistors and all the companies that made those power transistors went by the wayside after the integrated circuit companies came into, came into existence and started making a lot of integrated circuits and eventually replaced in, in many applications the power transistors in many applications. Obviously, they're still used in other applications, but that nanoelectronics is possible because of those sorts of breakthroughs. So using Jack Kilby's idea that you might want to think about something that's really off the wall and will it impact what you're doing. So what happens if there's biologically based electronics? I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of critical of these ideas, but they need to be considered. So before I get to an example of something that's really hard to believe that was published in Nature this year, first we're going to talk about something that I know very little about. I am not a biologist. So it's really hard for me to, to get into some of, of these ideas, but yet they're there, and because this has a possibility, I need to learn about it. So what's a, what's a genome? A genome is, you know, your complete set of DNA in, in one of the cells in your body, and they're composed of chemical units that are organized in a clear pattern, and once you have a pattern of stuff, you can encode information in it, and my goodness, encoding information is what nanoelectronics is all about. So, what happened? This is an amazing paper. It just is really bizarre. So someone took a bacteria's genomes and the genomes and they encoded a digital movie or parts of a digital movie in the genomes of a bacteria. Really wild. Why would you ever want to do that? I don't know. But they did it. And it's there. And so this is, an, uh, this is a look at an image of a hand that was encoded in the genomes of a certain bacteria. There's this five, five picture, if you will, movie of a horse running that they encoded by successively encoding each picture one at a time into the bacteria. That's really wild. All right, so first of all, that they could even do it is, is amazing. But if you stand back and, and, and 
suppress your amazement and say, well, what good is this? Well, other than, than an interesting breakthrough that you never, you never know what will be useful in the future, or maybe spies can put you know, information in a bacteria and you know, pass it around and then someone can decode it later. Other than that kind of wild, uh, interesting uh, thought, why would this be very useful? So, you know, when you stream from the web or whatever you're going to do, a movie, you want, if you're the hundredth person to look at that movie, you want its fidelity, the quality of the movie, to be exactly the same as the first person and exactly the same as the original that was uh, stored somewhere wherever you get the streaming from. Well, this kind of technology right now doesn't have that kind of very high fidelity. I think they talk about 90% in this paper. And this is really recent stuff. It's 2017. So, um, and uh, Shipman's getting some, Shipman and coworkers are getting some great notoriety for this. So, you know, will silicon nanoelectronics be replaced by biologically based electronics? And how will they analyze or image these things? How are you going to know about the arrangement? Because when you're talking about making electronics, you've got to have enough of whatever you're storing the information in for it to be useful and readable so you can get the information out and you can do computing with it. Well, it turns out that, as I mentioned at the start, if these wild ideas that are out there uh, ever become useful, it's going to be really hard to do quality control or even research and development on them because imaging organic molecules is really tough stuff. So here's a, here is a recent paper, a review of progress in imaging organic uh, molecules with transmission electron microscopy. And so you can see what the atomic arrangements might look like here, benzene rings, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen. You can see here that it doesn't look anything like what you uh, uh, draw in your PowerPoint drawing up here, uh, which is very different than, for example, the single crystals I showed you at the beginning of the talk. And here's a look at the top of a carbon nanotube. That's like graphene rolled up into a tube, if you will that uh, it has been functionalized, some various, uh, various molecules at the top, and, and they're bonded to this nanotube. And so there's a look at some sort of functionalized top of a nanotube. It's very hard to see it, and here's a look at the side of a nanotube. It doesn't, it doesn't have the uh, information um, quality, if you will, that I'm used to in uh, the work that I do. All right. Well, this. I mentioned before that it's possible to image, image these crystals because of aberration correction, image the atomic order much better with aberration correction. So what happens if you have a carbon nanotube and you put some, uh, some uh, iodine and potassium in there, potassium iodide, if you will, and uh, if here without aberration correction, you don't know where it is inside this nanotube, and this is a, a different potassium iodide crystal in here, obvious, guess obviously, I don't know. And you can see where the heavy atoms are and the lighter atoms are inside the carbon nanotube by using a special kind of aberration correction. Well, what happens if you put an organic molecule inside a carbon nanotube? Very difficult to see it in the same way that we're seeing it right now. So this is going to be a really difficult challenge for those of us that are, are working in nanoelectronics if this ever happens. So I think that's one of the reasons that, that it's uh, interesting to be critical about this. And yet, if you look at funding sources and people doing research, always got to look at the funding sources. You look at funding sources, they're funding this kind of wild, far out research right now. So if you're working in this field, you at least need to know about it and pay attention to it. And that's why I showed this image from the 2017 Nobel Prize in Chemistry showing that any advance in imaging a biomolecule is important enough and hard enough to win a Nobel Prize. And so with that, I thank you for listening.